Now, NDE Radio, a weekly exploration of near-death experiences and similar encounters with the other side. Now, here's your host, Lee Whitting. Welcome to NDE Radio with Lee Whitting, whether you're listening on TalkZone, by podcast, through the archives of our ad-free shows on our YouTube channel, or connected through the incredible content of our Facebook page. Our guest today, Danyan Brinkley, played a key role in the 1970s rediscovery of the near-death experience by serving as a powerful example for Dr. Raymond Moody's research into the subject of life beyond death. Danyan's first book, Saved by the Light, published in 1994, became a bestseller, and the following year's film of the same name made Danyan Brinkley's name a household word. All this was surprising given Danyan's shaky start into life as an egotistical bully, even from an early age. His time as a Marine trained him in more violent skills, and it was not until he was struck by lightning in 1975, died, and traveled to the other side, that his life was changed forever. Danian, welcome to NDE Radio. Oh, Lee, thank you. And, and thank you for doing this for as long as you've do, been doing it. Oh, well, thanks. Is, the near-death experience is the unsung hero of where science and consciousness and spirituality and and physical or medically allopathically meets. The yeah. near-death experience allows a common experience that happens and has historically happened that creates the conversation about what is death and when does death occur. Mm-hmm. You see, and it happens because In the past, there had to be rituals or spiritual systems that people understood, voodoo, witchcraft, shamans, uh, those that commune with the elemental natures of reality that could raise people from the dead, as Jesus supposedly raised Latin. Mm. But today, people are brought back because of allopathic's advancement and understanding the chemical and biological DNA structure of the physical chemical being. And that's how you get resuscitated. Carbonary rec- car- cardiopulmonary resuscitation techniques and advancements in understanding the heart is how you, you get back here. That's true. So, well, Daniel, the, the movie of your life, which I just watched the other day, uh, ah, portrays you. A, I'm, portray- now a Turner, I'm now a Turner movie class. <laughs> ah, all right. Well, congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> The movie uh, portrays you portrays you as a child as a pretty mean bully, and you've said in some interviews that you were like five hundred times worse than the movie says. But looking back on those days, what do you think made you so so angry? I would say it was a combination of three things: observing hypocrisy at a very young age, hmm. liars. Okay, observing hypocrisy, and then the power of moving forward was how feared you were or how emulated you were, okay? And so uh, it was a whole lot easier to knock them out than it was to be nice. (laughs) I didn't didn't need to be praised or build up some great (laughs) adoration for people to respect me. I just knocked them out. And... (laughs) I became that, you know, I I can't say that I was always a bully for the wrong reasons. I defended a lot of things that I thought were injustice or Mm -hmm. people being preyed upon. But I was a uh, I was a narcissistic, destructive, um, cunning, skilled individual that in the 70s. During and after this, the, the Vietnam conflict, there was organizations of now called contractors being created to stem the red tide after the defeat of the Vietnam War, mm. which has led us into what we now call the War on Terror. So I wandered through that in the early years after the service. And uh, it was a good thing I got struck by lightning. Yes. Now, you were on the phone when lightning came through the line, and uh, 
Describe for our listeners what happened to you when that hit you. Well, go from this. This is 1975, everybody. Yeah. Raymond Moody's landmark book, Saved by, I mean, uh, Life After Life had not come out. The person who defined the term near-death experience, it had not been known, Dr. Raymond Moody. Well, I'm sitting talking on the telephone to a good friend of mine, probably one of my very best friends, holding the phone. Lightning comes down the phone line. It hits me in the side of the head. It goes down my spine. It wears the nails of the heels of my shoes to the nails of the floor, throws me in the air, suspends me in the air there, and fractures my back in two places, slams me back down on the bed. I'm paralyzed. I cannot move. I am in so much pain. It's like drinking battery acid. I am burning. I can't see. And all of a sudden, I'm out of body. I right. can see clearly. I was watching myself lying across that bed. I had no grip on what this was. But what I had a grip on was this. Wherever I was at that point was a lot better than where I just left. You see, <laughs> I had an easy viewpoint. I could see. I could not feel that pain. I felt a calm presence around me. You know, like I'm, when you're a little kid, you're around your grandparents. You know you're okay, and, you know, they're going to forgive whatever it is you broke and all that kind of conscious feeling. And then I watched them move me into the ambulance. I watched the guy say he's gone, he's gone, because he's got his headset on talking back and forth to the hospital. And then I don't remember much after that for two or three days. I have pieced together most of what happened to me from talking to my dad, my brother, my sister, my friends, you know, all the people that were so close to me in those days. And then this tunnel begins to form over my left shoulder and I move down that tunnel and I come in this place of light and I look at it and it's the only term, and this is a, I used to use this in the early days, Lee, to describe the place, but I, I now have to be careful. But the, if you look up the word sensual in the dictionary and you take sex out of it and you put sensual, that's how I felt. Hmm. It was a sensual, vibrant, vibrant level of nature that was blue and silver and shimmering. And I decided to look at my right hand and this is a big problem I have today. I'm left-handed so why would I look at my right hand? Okay? Why would I look at my right hand since I'm left-handed? But I could, all of a sudden my hand appeared. I could see it. It wasn't hmm. like the hand that I have now is the wrinkled thing that's in front of me. It was a shimmering silver identity that gave me form and I could move it because as I looked at it, I moved it and saw it existed. Then a being came toward me. Uh, uh, some people say angel, but it was a being that came toward me. I do not relate what happened to me in religious senses, all that there are many things in religion that correlate to what happened to me, mm. like the 12 beings and the 13 being just like the disciples and the number 12 historically numerically throughout the cultural history but the moment i was aware of the being moving toward me my hand disappeared before i quit looking at it okay <laughs> it just went wherever it was i needed to see i had a hand that's what i needed to see i had one and i did i didn't look at feet or anything like that and i was comfortable and this being came and i had a life review and I think that the single most important thing for anybody who listens to this, that they take this away. The Hall of Records or the Great Book of Judgment and all those terms that we hear, something like that does exist. I call it the Panoramic Life Review. And you will see your entire life pass before you in a 360 degree panorama. And you will watch it from a second person point of view as though you were your own best friend. Hmm. 
So when someone is making fun of you being stupid or doing something really stupid or doing something really great, it's you looking at you from a higher sense that whatever face or laughter or whatever you feeling you get from it, it has not ego in it. It's your best friend making fun of you. And then you literally become every person that you ever encounter and you feel the direct results of your interaction between you and every other person. You become them. Well, that was life changing for me. If that's as far as I'd ever got, that was enough. Because to know that I knew everything about the events, because it was me. It wasn't somebody telling me this story. It was me experiencing it. So I didn't need to know anything else. I just didn't know that, that I was going to go to this crystal city. I was going to merge with this being. And I was going to go before this beautiful, magnificent cathedral looking place. And these 12 beings appeared and a 13th being appeared and they were shimmering. I'm still happy that I'm not in that body. Okay. Yes. I hadn't quite gotten over the fact that I'm not in that body. So I'm, I'm me. I'm me, but I have a, a deeper sense of value and I could feel me. I'm sensual. I can feel the nature of me when I think or when I feel an emotion about something. I am aware of it instead of Physically, you're not aware of it, or you you block it, or you stuff it down, or you explode, or you celebrate mm -hmm. it. But I could feel all that and feel it was connected to everything around me. And then I saw these, what I became to call the boxes of knowledge. And it was a series of events that was different from the place where we were, Lee. I could smell the smells, which is I didn't smell anything. I wasn't conscious of smelling anything when I was in the level of consciousness, going down the tunnel, lifting above my body. I was aware I wasn't breathing. Okay. And because I was central, I could wear that I was aware that I was pulsing. I think they think that's why the heartbeat is so important. And keeping your heartbeat at a regular beat and taking care of that becomes important because that's the true signature of who you are all the way back into the heavens. That heartbeat and that nature of intention of love is how you are connected to who you truly are as opposed to this being that you've given a name to. Does that make any sense? Yes, it does. It certainly does. So that's the, this is the truth, Lee. I mean, you know, People who had near-death experiences, they come back and say, well, what they learned from it is they're not afraid of dying. Well, what they learned from it is that you don't die. <laughs> you know, that is a lie. You will not ever die. It does not happen. There may be some point where you reconnect total to the system and the emergence of a new you can come into existence, okay? I mean, I have, to, I have to theorize a lot based on what I know about making this journey more than four times. And I'm obsessive compulsive and I'm curious. And if you're not gonna die and you're not gonna go to hell, Everything else gets to be just about entertainment. Are we here to be entertained or to entertain? To do both. We had talked a little earlier about our bodies being somewhat like avatars where we're projecting ourselves from the heavenlies into our bodies and living our lives down here. Do you see that as a possible example of what you're talking about now? Well, nobody ever leaves divinity. There is no separation from the divinity. So the conversations that people have about physical reality and all that kind of stuff, when I look at it and I understand science, it's easy to understand that you're not here because based on my observation, we have created this reality 
And God's sense of humor says that when you see it with your eyes, it's upside down till it hits the optic nerve. <laughs> and I think that that's, I think that that sense of humor is a God that I like. You yes. know, <laughs> yes. you cannot scare me, Lee. You cannot scare me into thinking you can threaten to kill me. And you not, cannot scare me or move me from what I think is my divine mission, no matter what. Right. We take you back to uh, those 13 visions, those boxes that you were being shown since you're talking about what our mission is. Okay, well, it, well, for me, mine was to create the centers. Mine was not drawn out. And every time I've ever gone over there, and every time of that, they're all always a part of it is about this center. Mm -hmm. And the big thing is, the big goal of, uh, I know this sounds funny, but people who had near-death experiences are called. You know, you're called. Your ticket came up, okay? Mm -hmm. And you accept, that, you accept that calling and service or you don't. And from the simplest little thing, I'm nobody from nowhere, just a mean, aggravating, narcissistic bastard, okay? <laughs> I do right because I know better. <laughs> not because I am not me but i do right because i know better and over the last 50 years or 45 years that nature has worn on me i have become what i did knowing better you don't have to have a life review and see what you see about you and only you know it yeah. and think that that's the way that every single one of us is going to deal with it. And it changed me. I, I refrained from things that were so easy. I had to go and listen to them talk about it while they were angry instead of breaking their jaw or putting a bullet in them. I had to listen. Why do you suppose you were shown prophecies as part of your journey? And here's what I thought, because anybody gets by Saved by the Light, which is a 28-year-old book, and you mm -hmm. go by Saved by the Light, you go to chapter five, and you read them. Read, just read chapter one, box one, two, three, four, five. We're in box 12. We're in the final box. And tell me what I missed. And the name of chapter uh, box 12 in chapter five is Technology and the Virus. And anybody can go to lightstreamers.com and go to that section on Mel's page. He houses that stuff for me. He's been around since I was first struck by lightning. And we've been friends for, a, for as long as that's been around. And he houses that. It's lightstreamers.com. And read the boxes of knowledge. And I hope you buy the book because... The fact that I saw the future, what I thought they were, Lee, was the markers I had to be at based on achieving putting the center program into play on the earth. And I had to wait for each of these events to transpire before I could take the next move, like when we went from analog to digital. All the people out there in the world who had this happen to them, and they had nobody to tell. They had nobody to tell it to. And Raym, uh, that's what I call Raymond, and Raym was pretty worn out by the end. I'd been through the open heart surgery then, and Raymond came to the hospital because I wasn't going to have the surgery. I'd had enough. And Raymond came and said, stay and help me. Hmm. And that was a converting factor in me having to have the surgery to come back. I was just going to die. Enough of it. And so... When I saw where Raymond was in the early 90s, he was beaten pretty bad because he had brought where people could talk about something that was happening to them that was so deeply spiritually consciously moving and they had no way. I decided that people needed to pick on somebody their own size. And I decided that was me. And so <laughs> I wanted to put all the stuff that was in the nifty notebooks, the little spiral notebooks that I had, I wanted to put all that stuff in a book and it had what became the prophecies 
I never saw it as that. I, I didn't have the mindset to see it as that way. It was Raymond who told me. He called me on the phone four years later and told me, because he knew them, which ones had come true. Chernobyl came true. This collapse of the Soviet Union came true. The environmental religion, I called it the environmental religion. They now call it climate change or global warming. Okay, but I, I could not understand how religions would come and support something that was paganism. And what we built Christianity on and what they built all the religions on, which was all those people who worship the earth and the burn witches, and which were midwives and all of that to create a, a religion. And they were becoming pagan again in protecting the earth and caring about paganistic and issues. So I call global woman the environmental religion. And then now the what's happening now is uh, I always have said that the battle for the souls of humankind would be fought in healthcare. And I built my whole life understanding palliative and end of life care. I am an expert in the dying process. I have 44, almost 45 years as a hospice volunteer. In the VA, I spent 37 years and I have $34,000 at the bedside of dying veterans. I've been with 2013 and 351 taking their last breath. And I helped write the, the No Bet Die Alone program that is the standardized end of life care model for the Veterans Administration. Mm. And I've taught the national classes. Daniel, um, I think you said in an earlier conversation that each time you crossed over that you saw pretty much the same thing. Did you see the same angel or that same being that uh, met you the first time? Yeah. And did they communicate or did he communicate with you? Oh, well, it's like it had a sense of humor. It was like it, it was there because it was part of what it was supposed to do to make sure I knew not to get weird. OK, because I I am I'm I'm I'm, a, I, I'm alive in a lot of reasons, Lee, because I'm smart and I pay a lot of attention and I've been in 94 countries. And I got out a lot of them. Hmm. OK, and. <laughs> Uh, by being that way, I'm very observant. So my safety factor had, had to been and is calculated and measured when I go back, when you go up, you know, they know about you. Everybody mm -hmm. knows about you and whoever the welcome committee is supposed to, what, what level of entry you come back based on the panoramic life review, who sets in motion what happens. It's very, it's very structured. It's very real. It's very articulate, it's very loving, and very beautiful, and no one gets away. Ask anybody who's ever had a near-death experience if they had something that they would call a review of their life, okay? I would find maybe three, maybe four percent say no. And then you listen to the depth of the near-death experience, and you see that they were just borderline. Their energetic frequency in the physical body had reached a point, I call it stressful, but emotionally, to where the frequency of the spiritual self could not stay attached. You have to take care of your physical body at your temple so that you can live in it. Because if you deplete it down to a certain point by breaking down your immune system, the spiritual self cannot stay. It cannot do it. It has to have a certain harmonic frequency of you taking care of yourself so it can stay involved in the job experience of being here on the earth. And that's the end of that story, Lee. See, people talk all that stuff, but I live in life. I live in the end of life and palliative care, and I watch people and I study everything. You know, everybody who knows me knows I'm, I'm like a laser. You know, and I'm nosy, <laughs> you know, and if you kill me, you got my attention. <laughs> <laughs> now, somewhere you said, I think that you believe there might be, or you've read perhaps that there are seven heavens that, that you'd seen possibly four levels of those seven heavens. Were there differences yeah, no. there? Yeah, absolutely. Genesis says there are seven heavens. Okay. That's where I got that from, because I would be aware of consciousness and levels. Of once you get through 
what I call, I call the blue gray place. This place is in the brain surgery. Okay, I, I spent 41 hours in recovery. They couldn't wake me up because I was amazed at this. When you lift out of your body, you come to a place where you're acclimating in the world that you're leaving and you're acclimating to the level of divinity that or spirituality or, that you've entered. You're acclimating. You're aware of the acclimation, like onions being peeled, skins being peeled away. You're aware of it. And as it happens, you're acclimating. Well, I've seen the first time or the first two times that I saw existed as a level of consciousness. I called it the blue gray place mm -hmm. because free will allows you not to have to come back until your time's up. So where I then knew where goats live, where spirits live, where possessions live. Okay. In this level of free will, you do not have to go down the tunnel. You do not have to go back to heaven. Free will, and once you get caught up in the absorption of identity of free will and develop certain psychosis, like addictions and alcohol, you still want to stay in this plane. But your time in this plane is over, mm -hmm. usually because of something you did to yourself based on free will and the nature of forgiveness that exists when you make a mistake here. Okay? So... When you, when you see these levels, this, this level of where I saw veterans feeling them being betrayed and, you know, it was horrible. That's why when I got up, I created the Twilight Brigade. Every time one of these things happened, I do something about what I see. Yeah. I don't yeah. talk and go around selling books and all of that. I recruit hospice and county care volunteers and look at home health care because that's where it's going to go and find protocols that help and empower the veteran when they come into my lane, palliative and end of life, because I am them. So in each of these levels, you go back to the level of what you are required based on how you lived your life that you just witnessed. And because I was so curious in the third near-death experience, I was able to see those realities what constitutes or creates them. And then you see that when you look at Indian philosophy and some of the Mayan philosophy, most of the Mayan philosophy, there were nine tiers. There are nine tiers to Nirvana, nine tiers, much of the Indian temples, all of this. I'd like to move into some of the, uh, some of the statements you made earlier today when we were talking. Uh, you said people get in line to get free will uh thinking it's the it's the greatest thing they could ever have until they get it now this is souls lining up in heaven ready ready to be born is that what you're talking about when that fetus is created and this is a Daniel viewpoint not a i won't say it's an absolute empirical fact yep but it's a Daniel viewpoint and it's well studied <laughs> that when that fetus is born Big beings stand in line and hope it's them that at the split second that being takes a breath, it is you. So people argue with me about when is conception or inception. We know when conception is. When is inception? Okay. Mm. Well, I'm of the believer that until that first breath is taken, it's just a system in place that a being can come. And like I said earlier, by the big lie, accept the big lie to do what their life mission is. I believe you're chosen to come here and you choose to come here, but you don't enter that be that body until you're chosen. Do beings enter before? I believe that that's possible. I believe it might be practical so that you can absorb knowledge of the world that you're living in, of the parents, of the families, the interactions that you're feeling through the mother. But I, I, I believe that when that first breath, the reality of who's going to occupy that space is then. Because the divine represents itself in the unseen. You would call that air. 
How long can you live without God? How long can you hold your breath? So when you look at it from that point of view, the respect you pay to divine is not how breathe, how deep you breathe in, but the value of when you breathe out. What is your intention about when you breathe in? Because shallow breath is controlled by ego that allows free will to harm something that you know better than to do. <laughs> you know better to do it, okay? Moderation has a concept to it, but you know better. And knowingly knowing better and breathing in and out, you, you disrupt the system. And the system will extract, I won't say the pain, but the system will extract that value because this is how it functions. You know, just like dementia, a neuropeptide bonds firing and synapse, synapse to electrons and neutrons being able to fire in between the chemical structure of the neuropeptide bonds in the brain. When that stops happening because of sugar and uh, dementia is diabetes, then when that starts and that happens, then you did, it. you did, it. you know. So when you I, we're back about about the four levels of consciousness, but it's about responsibility and free will. That to know that you have is the gift. How does that relate? You called the big lie the notion that we are separate from everything when we're here. I call the people who come here great, powerful, and mighty spiritual beings with dignity, direction, and purpose. That's every single one of us that takes a breath on this earth. You have earned the right. You have to be some kind of hero, some kind of magnificent hero in the conscious world of how you measure devotion to the divine, all that stuff, religions, preach, and all that, and love them with your heart and soul, and blah, 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 all that. <laughs> you would have had to achieve that or you wouldn't be here. Okay, mm -hmm. free will gives you a chance to choose what you'll do or what you won't do. And all of it's okay, <laughs> you know? It's okay because you're going to face you and you're going to face yourself for the reasons why you did it. And the highest divine nature of you is going to face it. Not this you with your little petty, narcissistic, whiny box, cry baby victim psychology. No spiritual being can conceive of itself as a victim. That's insanity. It's the same thing like dying. How in the heck are you going to think you're going to die? Any, you guess a billion of us, 25 million of us has had this experience. And me, I wouldn't be telling this stuff if it didn't happen to me. Mm. I wouldn't care and I probably wouldn't believe it. But it doesn't change it. So when you get here, you accept what I call the big lie. Because in the divine world, you're never helpless and you're never alone. Never. But when you come here, since I believe the purpose of everyone's life is to practice being a God, this is where you get a chance to come and practice to being a God so that you could be inspiration somewhere else in the universe, that you would inspire others based on what you're doing here. If you're helpless and if you believe that you are alone and you keep up the good work, and that's what you focus on and that's what you do, you're the winner. Okay, so the big lie helplessness when you're born and when you're cast you're helpless and loneliness everybody experiences and we just got a dose of it with what's called the pandemic we just got a perfectly designed dose of helplessness and loneliness so the games in play that the battle for the souls of humankind will be fought with healthcare and i really don't need another sign that tells me that what i saw in those boxes of knowledge and what I have watched happen over the last 47 years, where I believe we are is exactly where we are based on visions I had 47 years ago. And anybody can just look what I miss. All right. Wow. What did they miss? Yeah. None. Okay. There's a couple I never saw, but in the books that I wrote after saved, I explained, I, I, you know, when I didn't see it happen or, I couldn't find it happen. I mean, I did Chernobyl. I did Fukushima. Mm. 
okay? I couldn't find the, uh, that I thought that terrorists would poison the water system in Paris, okay? And I thought about, uh, I wrote about uh, Simon Rushdie and his book, and then the water, the poison of the water in Paris. I never could find that. I never could find it. And if I couldn't find it, then I didn't, I don't, I don't put it as, I put it in the didn't come true category. Okay. Mm. <laughs> All right. That didn't happen. Yeah. But about World War Three and about where we are right now and about, about where the Ukraine is, <laughs> didn't miss a minute. Yeah. Right on it. You said when you were recovering, I guess, 1975 to eight and learning to walk again, and you would have trances or spells where you'd see things that relate to parallel universes and quantum mechanics and timelines. And multidimensional realities. Hmm. Levels of consciousness exist ethereal, interdimensional realities. Watch this. I, would, I couldn't walk and I'd pass out all the time. And I... I mean, I'd hit the walls and knock myself out, but I could get in the chair and I'm a devoted rocker. I could rock like there's no tomorrow. And I would use my toes because I was trying to figure out how to make my muscles work. And I would use my toes to rock that chair and I could hit a certain pace and a certain rhythm in that chair. And I would move into a level of consciousness and I would move through these realities to go wherever they were going to show me something. And most of it was about crystal energetic patterns, alopic energetic patterns, scalar waves, essences and fragrances, and all the things that make the human spirit resist physical damage. Okay, and mm -hmm. uh, the smell of something and the thoughts that it brings, all of these things that only that you could put in healthcare. But sometimes I pass through levels of consciousness, Lee, that uh, they were interdimensional beings. I mean, I've never written about this, but uh, Catherine, that's my ex wife. One day I was describing, we were sitting and I was describing this world that I'd seen and I'd seen it a couple of times, never doing the death experience, but afterwards I would see these in beings and I described them and she said they were insectoids. So I looked them up and they were the smartest beings in the universe. Well, in this last thing in 2018, four years ago, I saw them again. And I made fun of it because they were dressed up. The, the first times when I would pass through their world, sometimes they stopped and paid attention to me. And they were like in a group. And then other times they didn't give me it, it. They didn't give me the time of day. I didn't matter. But this time they had on their, their apparel. They, you know, their chalice necklaces, but they look like I would say a praying mantis, okay? I saw them again this last, when you look at where the world is and you look at the blue gray place and you pay attention to it and look at what's going on, there has to be a way that you capture the physical nature of free will and remove the spiritual dimensional level of the person who was originally there. Okay, so I did a study on, I decided to do a study on exorcisms. Because if I did a study on exorcisms and I have criteria, there's been a 700% increase in exorcisms. If you have an exorcism, that means that you are possessed. And if you are possessed, knowing that we are in the birth of a new age, December the 21st, 2012, we're in the birth of a new age, then the, that means the veil is really thin, then people could be easily possessed because a free will allows you to consciously do things to yourself 
for some kind of escape reason or some kind of rationalization that you knowingly hurt yourself. Well, you can only sustain X amount of that before you go crazy, lose your mind, or take too many drugs, or go to the psychiatrist too often, you know, before that happens, and then possession comes. So, you know, it helps me understand why so many people are so crazy now, <laughs> you know? I have always been a supporter of hospice, and you started something you call the Twilight Brigade. And perhaps if you talk about it, it will encourage people to volunteer to do hospice work, because I think if they are interested in these programs that I'm doing with NDEers, they would be fascinated by the privilege of being with people who are dying. So describe how you discovered hospice and, and what you've done with it. Well, I was my very first hospice volunteer. Everybody's going to be a hospice volunteer. They call you caregiver, but you're going to be a hospice volunteer. Sooner or later, you come here breathing X amount of breaths. You make a deal to breathe X amount of breaths. You're going to breathe in and you're going to breathe out. And when you breathe in, you stop before you breathe out. You don't breathe in and breathe out without a stop. There is a complete stop of that breath that fills that eight sinus cavities. An intention is set, the divine interacts, and then you breathe out. This is how the system works. Everything is about breathing in, holding that breath, setting the value of breathing out. Well, hospice gives you an opportunity to face yourself and be of service. And if you're a religious person, when it says, where two or more gather in my name, so shall I be among you. Yeah. Well, if you ever want to see if that's really true and that God everybody talks about is really there, then where is the one absolute place that that's going to happen when you're at that bedside? There's you, there's that person in transition, and God better show or not show, or a sign better show or not show. Okay, that's the test. Well, I do it for this reason. I'm going to be everybody that I ever encounter, and I'm going to feel the direct results of my interaction between me and that person. Can you imagine what it's like when that guy has had me at his bedside and I'm walking him through it, and he's looking up in my eyes and the feeling of the family of knowing that I am helping them as they are helpless, help this person who served this country transition. Can you imagine in the panoramic life of you what I've already seen mm. about who I am when I become that person? Get over it, everybody. Grow up. The moment that you realize that all we're ever talking about is nobody dies, then they can frighten you and scare you. Mm. And then figure out something you want to do that's in service. And you make it a part of every day. Make it a part of every day. I've got a line if you know, if you can't get to your son who came back wounded, this is what I've done. I've given tickets away. I had miles, millions of miles. So if you couldn't get to your son when he got to America or the States, I had a deal with Del Delta, a couple of other airlines. I could give them mileage and get them to their children. I know how important that is. And I talked to family members dealing with losing people. If you get over that you're not going to die, everybody. You let go of a pattern of behavior that lifts your heart and creates a sense of calm and peace. That there's not only a life after this one. When you realize how magnificent the world you came from, you'd also sense the heroism of what restrictions you placed on yourself to enter into this level of consciousness, good and bad. To practice being a God and to know that you're helpless and alone as you go about that service. That's where the person in transition is, the helplessness and alone, because no one understands. The hospice volunteer understands the art form of how you create value and closure for that person. Wow. Well, I'm among the best there is at this. I'm among the best there is because I study it. And I've done thousands, not twosies. I've done thousands of people. Yeah. So to become a hospice volunteer 
shows that you are a powerful being and you're willing to face your fears. And your fear is what now everybody uses to control you and puts the rules on you by which you can or cannot do and no one comes. You are the, we are the ones, we are the light bearers. We're the eight billion that's supporting probably a trillion other beings and other dimensions and other levels of consciousness. I have seen the other seven. There's really nine, but I'm only consciously aware of four at least. And yes. I can actively operate in those four. And I'm not going to say the Genesis says there's seven. The Hindus and the Indians say there's nine. The Mayans say there's nine. Okay, so I'm not going to I'm not going to not accept that. I know that the Bible says there's seven, so I stick right there. Okay, but I go to look to see where nines are. You know, I look for nines because nine is Tesla's holy number. Well, if you look in the Bible at the gifts of the Spirit, First Corinthians chapter twelve, verse one through twelve. If you do the service and the work of God, there are the gifts of the Spirit. There's nine of them. So when everybody starts waving the flag about how religious they are and how good a work they're doing, okay, then you just open the Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1 through 12 and ask them the question and check it off. I look forward to that challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Daniel, we're unfortunately out of time, but I want to thank you so much for sharing your story of your NDEs and of the wisdom you gained from uh, your, all your experience. Let me ask you something. Do you think I helped people in any way with me just sitting here telling the truth? Uh, the truth always helps. <laughs> Even unpleasant truths help. Yes, you certainly did. You certainly did. And just to repeat that same thing about working with hospice, it is such a valuable experience. You know, you're helping the person for sure, but you are learning so much in the process. You are enriching your soul to such a degree about that your... it's well worth doing. It's about yourself. Yeah, it what? is. And the connection that we have with one another, you know, we're all connected to one another anyway. So why not establish that connection at the point of departure for the other soul? To celebrate a life, Lee, mm. to celebrate a life and to know the art form. I, I'm creating transitions. I did the Twilight Brigade. Now I'm changing it to the Transition Brigade. So I can teach caregivers how to set up closure and how to give value. So it's coming on right. Like Ronnie is working on it. Bill, there the four people who are working on it now. To create a program that you go, if you're going to have a caregiver and everybody's going to be one, you yeah. take this program and then you know what to do. You know what to do. And the satisfaction you come in being able to celebrate on someone going home and knowing that their life had matter and knowing that uh, knowing the, the art form of closure and they let go, a part of you will feel that. You will see somebody come to get them. So I suspect that if you go to live streamers and you look at the Twilight Brigade, know it's becoming a transition brigade and sign up. There's a place that you can go and sign up so that I can let you know when the program becomes available. It'll probably be a Zoom. You know, and anybody who's ever taken the Twilight Brigade training know I'm hardcore. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm hardcore. I will make you magnificent or I will, I don't know what I'll do. But... <laughs> well, Daniel, tell the listeners how they can find your website and where they can find your books. Amazon. I'm working on a new book now. I've been writing it for like 10 years. It's called 10 Things to Know Before You Go. And it's me making fun of it. The first page is what's the number one cause of death in America and most other country mark. You turn to the second page, it says, no matter what you thought, birth is the number one cause of death. Birth. <laughs> and then you turn to the next page, it says, remember, if you're breathing, you're leaving. And if you just took a breath, this book is for you. But it's me making fun of all the taboos that we have associated with death over the last thousand years. I just make fun of them. Yes. And people need to realize that what they're most terrified of never happens. And they have to realize that what they're the most terrified is watching 
how much medicine knows about keeping you alive long past your designated time and what that costs you in damage. I'm not a supporter of euthanasia. I don't support that, but you can go when you get ready and you have to have an art form. Yeah. You know your life had value and destructive closure. And with those two things, that spiritual being has permission to say goodbye, which we call faith and leave. And I don't have any doubt about it because I right. seem to come and go at will. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is, you. thank you so much. If listeners would like to hear this show again or any of our more than 480 archived ad-free NDE interviews, go to TalkZone's NDE radio site and hit the Past Shows button or go to our YouTube channel, NDE Radio with Lee Whitting, where you can subscribe to and comment on the complete NDE radio library. Be sure to check out our NDE radio Facebook page. Just search NDE radio with Lee Whitting on your Facebook app. And listen again next Monday, 11 a.m. Eastern at Talk Zone for more NDE Radio. I'm your host, Lee Whitting, saying thanks for listening.